Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's time for part five of my series on communication satellites. And after we had a quick visit to the Soviet Union of the 1960s and 70s, we are returning to the United States. And now I want to talk about how we went from experimental NASA satellites to TV dishes on millions of homes around the world. Yes, satellite television is, uh, for many, the most visible example of satellite communication. So, in the mid-1960s, the experimental SYNCOM led to the Intelsat and international collaboration which delivered television across the oceans, bringing the world together for things like the Olympics, the moon landings and Elvis Presley live in Hawaii. Yes, the album of this actually comes with an accurate image of Intelsat 4 on its cover. There were many generations of Intelsat. Uh, the early ones used antenna, which radiated in a pancake pattern, which uh, simplified them for a whole uh, many reasons, but it also meant that they were radiating a lot of energy off into space. With the advent of Intelsat 3, this problem was fixed. It was still a 150 kilogram spin stabilized satellite, but now it had a D spun antenna system. This was a simple 45 degree reflector which would maintain alignment to the Earth while the satellite itself rotated at about 90 RPM. This would reflect the signals to the antenna in the core of the satellite and this arrangement allowed a narrower beam that could keep more of the satellite's transmission power on the Earth and improve performance of everything. Intelsat 3 also added a second transponder and more bandwidth. It could now relay four television channels and uh, 1,200 phone calls. They launched eight of these from 1968 to 1970. Intelsat 4 added a far more complex antenna system. It was still a despun antenna section, but now it had four wide field horn antenna covering the whole Earth and two large steerable parabolic antenna, which could transmit to a four and a half degree beam. That's about a three and a half thousand or 2100 mile footprint on the surface of the Earth. It was dependent, dependent on how the whole thing was operated. It could handle 12 color TV channels or up to 9000 phone calls. The Intel satellites would continue to evolve in this manner, adding more antenna, more transponders, smaller footprints, slicing up service in space and by frequency. Now, these satellites were all for international television and telecommunications, but in the United States, a television was still primarily being distributed across the country via microwave links over the land. But broadcast TV networks were interested in distributing their TV via satellite. In 1965, the American Broadcasting Corporation, ABC, filed a request with the FCC for authorization to begin operating a communication satellite so they could distribute their TV across the US. The FCC in turn initiated a larger inquiry encompassing the whole of the US media and communications industry. And in 1968, a task force was appointed by President Lyndon Johnson and it published its report supporting domestic TV satellites just in time for Nixon to take office and send them back to do more investigating until 1970, when it came back and gave pretty much the same conclusion. All this probably explains why the first domestic TV satellite would be Canadian, albeit built and launched by the US. The Anik A1 was built by Hughes Aircraft and it launched on the Delta 1914. It had a spinning barrel shaped body with a despun parabolic antenna, had a dry mass of about 150 kilogram and at launch it would weigh about 500 kilos including all the propellant. It had a lifetime of about seven years and it carried 12 transponders, each of which could carry a color television channel or 960 telephone connections. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation used three of the transponders, while the rest of the capacity was used for things like telephone and telegram. In the US, Western Union would launch Westar One in 1974. This would be the first US domestic communication satellite. It was an exact copy of Anik A and of course its first job was to relay telegram for its parent company, but at some point they would rent out the transponders to TV producers to distribute shows. And I don't know what the first show that was carried on West R1 was, but I think the most important one was when a regional cable TV network went nationwide via satellite on September 30th, 1975 at 9pm. 
Home box office began continuous satellite transmissions uh, with the thriller in Manila. Muhammad Ali versus Joe Frazier in the Philippines. HBO would be the first cable operator to distribute its programming via satellite. And it would only use the West Star satellite for four months because RCA's SATCOM 1 launched uh, in December of 1975 and it had 24 transponders cutting the costs and uh, SATCOM 3 would also begin carrying the three big US TV networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. SATCOM 1 was also notable in that it wasn't st been stabilized. Instead, it had active stabilization and rotating solar panels that would track the sun. A third provider of domestic satellite communications would be AT&T, which would launch Comstar and later Telstar 3 and 4 and so on. And while the demand would grow for satellite TV capacity necessitating quick growth, this wasn't supposed to be direct to home. It was distributed to base stations, which would then relay it via either terrestrial broadcast or cable to local markets. It wasn't supposed to be, of course, but nerds were interested, and it wasn't long before amateur radio operators figured out how to pick up these satellite transmissions. And one of the first amateur satellite listeners wasn't in the US and he wasn't trying to get free HBO. So in 1974, NASA had launched the sixth in a series of experimental communication satellites, Application Technology Satellite 6. The satellite was too big for the Delta rocket and it was launched on the much larger Titan 3C. I think this was the first three axis stabilized satellite in geostationary orbit and also one of the first satellites to use electric propulsion for station keeping. With the solar panels deployed, it was almost 16 meters across, 52 feet, and most importantly, it had a huge nine meter mesh parabolic antenna, which would fold out in space from a compact package. That antenna was needed because one of the primary goals was to demonstrate direct broadcast of satellite TV, and it was using 860 megahertz, requiring a much larger antenna to focus the longer wavelengths. So ATS-6 was first used over the United States for things like teleeducation and telemedicine experiments. This was from August of 1974 of May to 1975. It, it was an extension of a previous satellite telemedicine program that was carried by ATS-1. And this had allowed doctors in Alaska to consult with specialists thousands of miles away. ATS-6 would transmit educational programming to stations across the US and reception on the ground would use a 10 foot dish and three meters with antenna and an amplifier which could feed down coaxial cable into a decoder box which could finally feed into a regular television. Of critical importance to the development of a low cost receiver was the fact that the satellite was in geostationary orbit. The antenna wouldn't need accurate motorized tracking to keep pointing at the satellite. It could be targeted on the one satellite by an engineer and then left fixed in that configuration. At the time, it was estimated that by NASA that the per unit cost could be as low as $2,000. This is in early 1970s dollars, of course. After this experiment, it was moved east to begin a collaboration with the India Space Research Organization transmitting educational television to remote villages and somewhere along the line, a BBC transmitter engineer called Stephen Burkle figured out how to build his own receiver in his back garden, becoming probably one of the first people to have a home satellite system. He had something like a 10 foot or three meter dish, which he manually adjusted until he got the best signal. It wasn't great quality, but he was just thrilled to receive signals intended for another part of the world. He'd iterate on his design and develop better decoding hardware, and he ended up receiving other satellite signals from other satellites, things, even the Soviet systems. Speaking of which, around this time, uh, the Soviet Union launched their Ekran geostationary satellites, and like ATS, uh, these were direct broadcast tele TV satellites. They operated at 714 megahertz with enough power that people wouldn't need the massive orbiter antenna. So by the mid 1980s, there'd be like a hundred orbiter antenna receivers, but there would be thousands of ECRAN receivers. The antenna on the satellite was a 96 element phased array of helical antennas. 
Early on in the design process, this was envisaged to be a much larger beast. It would be a nuclear powered, you know, five kilowatt satellite requiring a high performance fluorine hydrogen upper stage on the Proton rocket. But at some point, they clearly designed, uh, decided to dial back the insanity and stick with a smaller solar powered satellite. Anyway, after ATS-6, NASA was in the process of cutting costs, but found the resources to work on one last communication satellite with Canada. Uh, Canada covered most of the cost. Europe contributed a traveling wave tube, but the communications technology satellite, also known as Hermes, was launched in 1976. And again, this was a three-axis stabilized satellite using momentum wheels and hydrazine thrusters with a 6.2 meter long fold-out solar panels. It would generate 1.2 kilowatts. And it also had an amplifier and an antenna that can deliver more than 10 times the power of other satellites of the era. It was the first communication satellite to operate in the KU band, receiving at 14 gigahertz and transmitting at 12. This was critically important change because the C-band transmissions of previous satellites had actually been artificially limited to avoid interfering with microwave links on the ground. Also, by shortening the wavelength, you could, all, you could shrink down the antenna on the ground and maintain the same directional sensitivity. Furthermore, unlike the commercial TV satellites of the era, it only had two transponders, meaning that there was more power available per transponder. It had two steerable 71 centimeter paraboloid antenna with a beam width of about 2.5 degrees. And this was designed so that signals received on one antenna would be amplified and transmitted out on the other. So this enabled high quality color TV that could be received with DISH. Not much smaller than Steve Burkle's homemade receiver, but it was vastly better quality thanks to the more powerful signal. Two-way voice communications via the satellite was also demonstrated using much smaller antenna, yet uh, antenna of 60 centimeters or two feet. As I mentioned, NASA didn't have money to spare at this point, and it didn't have the resources to develop experiments on its own. To, uh, so uh, it basically made time on the satellites available to groups that submitted a suitable application. So NASA could provide some support with mobile base stations, but the TV and radio production equipment had to be provided by the participants. As you can imagine, there were a lot of universities doing things like sharing educational video coursework, medical organizations doing telehealth experiments, connecting doctors and remote patients. Digital communication was also tested using new modulation techniques. They were able to send 60 megabits per second over one of the transponders, including demonstrations of digital television signals. But one experiment stands out. It was known as Send Receive. Uh, and it was intended as an art piece connecting artists in New York and San Francisco. Well, actually it was in NASA Ames Research Center about 30 miles south of San Francisco, but you know, who's counting? The participants were visual artists, video, filmmakers, dancers, and musicians. And the demonstrated consisted of basically verbal interactions and, and you know, dance performances where they'd react to each other. As I said, the, the experiments were available to anyone with the resources and skills to use a satellite. So for the Canadian side of the experiment, these were broadly similar to what the US was doing. You know, again, communicating with remote locations via satellite TV and radio, but they had actual funding from the government to support them. However, one important historic event stands out from this communication technology sta satellite. In May of 1978, it televised the National Hockey League's Stanley Cup playoffs, specifically directing it for Canadian diplomats in Peru. Hermes was the first KU band satellite, the first satellite that operated in the portion of the radio spectrum assigned for direct broadcasting by the ITU. And a decade later, the Hermes satellite program was awarded an Emmy for this, right? Pioneer of direct broadcast satellite television technology. Japan launched Yuri-1 in April of 1978. And again, this was an experimental KU band satellite and this would be a key step towards the first public broadcast of satellite TV. 
Um, so NHK finally made uh, satellite broadcast direct to the home available in 1984. And this moved them out of the experimental phase and into people's homes. Europe would get direct to home broadcasting in the late 1980s with the Astra satellite. But the US took a different route. While all these experiments in the official direct broadcast frequencies were happening, there's a steadily growing group of amateur radio hackers who were following in Steve Burkle's footsteps and they were building their own home satellite systems with monster dishes. And this held particular allure in the USA because instead of paying a monthly subscription to a cable company like HBO, you could receive their transmissions directly from the satellites for free. Well, other than the huge technological uh, hard, you know, dish and everything that you had to invest in. But as technology improved and more operators documented their work, it became more accessible beyond the hardcore radio fans. A commercial market grew out of the community. Restaurants and hotels were getting equipment installed so they could offer HBO. And eventually, HBO began scrambling the signal send selling uh, unscrambling hardware and uh, satellite editions along with subscriptions. And so commercial direct to home satellite in the US really grew out of this amateur market. The people who'd invested on in those big satellite dishes weren't too happy when content began getting scrambled. In 1986, there was an infamous case involving an engineer who had been making a good business selling the satellite hardware and he'd seen his business practically wiped out when HBO began scrambling their signal. To make up for lost income, he'd taken a part-time job at a local satellite uplink station, or teleport. And one night after finishing up his scheduled transmissions, he uh, swung the dish around and used it to take over HBO's transponder on the Galaxy satellite, forcing it to display a test card with a short message from Captain Midnight protesting the 1295 fee uh, subscription fee that they were now charging. There was still plenty of other free satellite content available on those big dishes. It wasn't necessarily well documented, but if you knew if you looked around you could find it. I know one person who set up a dish so that he could get Star Trek the Next Generation a few days ahead of broadcast when it was delivered by satellite to regional stations. So the US market would stick with these big, unwieldy C-band dishes, and it would actually remain uh, small because cable TV was already entrenched there. There were lots of companies getting approval to launch their own modern high-power KU-band direct broadcast satellites through the 1980s, but none actually got around to launching anything. The US home satellite TV market would lag behind Japan and Europe uh, for many years. The US would get Direct TV One in 1993, launched on an Ariane rocket, and a EchoStar One, which was the base of a Dish Network, launched on a Chinese rocket in 1995. So anyway, these days, of course, there's choice in almost every nation around the world, heck, even on aircraft. And it all comes back to experiments that sat NASA performed, sending educational programming to remote viewers. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Oh,